Chris, that was fantastic. I like the uh, the ten um, almost best practices. Um, it, it's interesting. So I, I, I I'm not a uh, I'm not a sleep researcher. I full disclosure, and. Um, what I've, all of the research that has been coming out on sleep and obesity has started to make it onto some of these, you know, messagings uh, around obesity prevention. So, you know, we do 5210, but now we're starting to think, should we do maybe a 105210? So um, I am going to walk you through um, some of the research on childhood obesity and sleep duration. And again, full disclosure, I'm not a, I'm not a sleep researcher. And the reasons, I'll, and I'll tell you as we go through this, of how I became interested in sleep was really backing into it. Um, there was uh, really good research coming from the adult um, literature. Um, I actually thought it was paradoxical that insufficient sleep was associated with obesity instead of the other way around. And um, had some preliminary data from a cohort that I work with ignored it forever, ignored it for about four or five years where we were finding short sleep associated with obesity, did, never did anything with it. And then some of the adult work uh, started being produced. So I'll, I'll walk you through some of it because it wasn't, in, it wasn't something that was intuitive, at least to me. So um, we'll talk first about the patterns of childhood sleep duration, um, sleep uh, and its association with obesity in children. You all probably um, are interested in some of the mechanisms, and I'll walk you through those. But by now, you've realized that I'm very practical and pragmatic, and you know some of this evidence that uh, that we that you know, my team sees in the literature. I really like to test it and to figure out how we can put some of these best practices into interventions. So, I'll walk you through two intervention studies where we've tried to improve sleep and sleep quality for obesity prevention. So secular trends in uh, childhood sleep duration. Uh, so it, it's interesting because the childhood obesity epidemic has been paralleled by, by what seems like a secular trend of shorter sleep durations in children. So the same amount of time over the last 20 or 30 years where the obesity epidemic has been increasing, there's been a pretty substantial decrease in sleep duration in children, ranging from about 30 to 60 minutes over the last 20 years. And it looks like it's due largely in part to later bedtimes. It's across all age groups, but significantly more so, it seems like, in adolescence. So not no surprise. Um, but also it's true even um, between five and eight years of age. And again, it, it seems that these decreases in sleep duration have, uh, have really been a result of later and later bedtimes. You know, I, I had to pick up a prescription for my son at, uh, at my local CVS. It was 9.45 p.m., and there were more children there than I, than I would you know, normally see in, uh, in, in, at that time anywhere else. I, I couldn't believe it. But it, it's, it's part of our lives today that children are just going to bed later and later, and I think that's been the result of that are these trends in, in substantially uh, less sleep uh, which appears to be paralleling the obesity um, epidemic. So I became very interested in what's been happening in uh, the trends in sleep duration. We know that developmentally, children decrease the amount of sleep that they get from birth uh, through adolescence. And this shows from the National Sleep Foundation the average number of hours that children sleep in a 24-hour period. So we know that this is, this is the pattern. Children... Um, sleep less as they get older. But what I found interesting was what, um, what characterizes the children at the lower quartile, the lower 25%. So who gets, uh, what characterizes those children who um, are really not sleeping enough? And there's some really good evidence of what characterizes those children in infancy and in that kind of birth to two years of age. Children in that lowest quartile are more likely to be put to bed asleep versus drowsy or awake. Again, interfering with their self-regulation, their self, uh, you know, their ability to fall asleep on their own. And children, uh, older children in the lower quartile of sleep, were more likely to share a room or bed, more likely to drink a caffeinated beverage during the day, more likely to have a TV in the room where they sleep. So some really interesting. Um, opportunities for interventions, which is what I always look for when I interpret the literature. 
Among adolescents, this slide shows, also from the National Sleep Foundation, the amount slept on school nights versus the amount that adolescents reported they needed. 56% of adolescents said they slept less than they needed. And if you uh, look at the percentages who reported that they got less sleep than needed on school nights, that was about 72% of children in, as, as seniors in high school. Only one in five adolescents get an optimal nine hours of sleep on school nights. More than half of adolescents say they know they get less sleep than they need to feel their best. And almost all adolescents have at least one electronic item, multiple electronic items in their bedrooms. So it, it's, a, it's a serious issue. It's, it's actually more prevalent in my practice and in my pediatric practice than I would have thought. And I didn't start, I didn't recognize it until I, until I started asking it. Um, what do things look like in adults? So there's uh, some similar patterns happening in adults over the last 40 <laughs> years. Daily sleep duration has decreased by about one to two hours. And studies uh, using objective measures of sleep duration, either actigraphs or accelerometers, have found that average sleep time in adults has decreased to about six hours or so per night with shorter sleep time in women and African Americans. So I showed this slide earlier, the percentage of adults who reported insufficient rest or sleep during the preceding 30 days uh, in 2008. Again, striking that it's so similar, and actually I'll show you the uh, similar uh, map from the CDC, from BRFSS of obesity trends in the US. Very similar patterns to those same states that have um, high rates of adults reporting that they're getting insufficient sleep. And similar to obesity, um, as I mentioned earlier, sleep duration in adults has been linked to almost every single uh, adverse event that you could think of. All-cause mortality, shorter life expectancy, uh, impaired immune function, cancer, obesity. So it, it's, um, it's, it's been more and more uh, shown through evidence in adults and now emerging evidence in children that there are some pretty significant chronic disease risks associated with, uh, with curtailed uh, sleep. So I want to, to now focus the, the conversation a bit on short sleep and childhood overweight. I mentioned um, that cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies have found this inverse association between sleep duration and weight in children. But over the last two or three years, there have been uh, more and more studies showing that short sleep duration in children is associated with higher BMI Z score, increased fat uh, consumption, shorter and longer sleep associated with insulin resistance, and low sleep efficiency, which means how well do you sleep when you are in bed and are supposed to be sleeping, associated with elevated blood pressure in children and adolescents. I mentioned this study earlier as well in a, a pre-birth cohort that I work with, uh, Project Viva. We found this relationship with, in infancy with children who slept less than 12 hours per day having increased odds of obesity. And this, you know, we, we didn't go into it with a specific threshold of sleep that was risky. And it just, um, looking at the, the, uh, the way, the pattern of our uh, results really indicated that 12 hours in infancy from birth to 12 year, birth to two years seemed to be kind of this risk threshold that put children at higher risk of some of our anthro outcomes at, uh, at three years of age. So, so that was at three years, but we've been very interested in following these children to see whether, two things, whether that um, short sleep in early life, in infancy, is still associated with obesity later in childhood. But also, you know, getting a sense of whether, and what I see in my clinic is chronically being uh, sleep deprived. So it's one thing to ask, is that early, you know, is there a critical period? Is short sleep duration in infancy sustained, have a sustained effect on anthropometric outcomes? Does it, is it lasting? But the second thing is, um, what we are seeing more and more of is, what if you are chronically sleep deprived? What, uh, what effect does that have on BMI and, um, and metabolic syndrome components, inflammation, things that increase our chronic disease risk? So in this same cohort that I work with, it's, a, it's called Project Viva. It's a pre-birth cohort examining associations of pregnancy health with maternal and child outcomes. 
and we recruited women in their first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, between 1999 and 2002, we've been following the women and the children are now turning about 12 years of age. We had about 2,100 births, and of those, 1,700 were eligible for an age seven visit, which is the, the results that I'm gonna show you in a second. 65% completed an in-person visit where we did measures of their height and weight, body mass index, and uh, DEXA uh, for uh, fat mass index. And uh, 10, uh, 1,045 of those are included in this analysis that I'm gonna show you. So first, um, we, a, a few things that we found. So in this slide, we show the sleep durations by age period. Um, the average sleep duration from six months to two years was about 12 hours. Uh, from three to five years was about 10.8 hours, and six to seven years was 10 hours. So this is already a group that is sleeping well. <laughs> in that group, about 39% of six-month to two-year-olds um, had sleep curtailment in that infancy period. 13% of three to five-year-olds were sleeping less than 10 hours per day, and 8% of the six to seven-year-olds were sleep sleeping less than nine hours per day, which is defined as sleep curtailed. And we found in some of the multivariable analyses that we did, trying to adjust for confounders and uh, you know, variables that are associated with both uh, obesity and insufficient sleep, we found that uh, two things. One was that sleep, uh, too little sleep in infancy, that infancy period did appear to be a critical period. So children who had slept less than 12 hours per day in that six month to two years of age, that seemed to have a lasting effect on their BMI. So those children had higher BMI Z-score, higher DEXA fat mass index, and a higher waist circumference. But the other thing we found, we created a score of how often between six months to two years those children were in that sleep curtailment uh, category. And we scored them if they were more likely, if they had more periods from that uh, childhood, in that childhood period, of being sleep deprived, they had a higher score, and if they had fewer uh, episodes of being sleep curtailed, and sorry, I forgot to mention, so we've assessed these children at six months, one, two, three, four, five, so, and these are the results at seven years, but every single year we've asked about uh, sleep duration. So this score, essentially a higher score, means that in that childhood period you, uh, you had more times where you were sleep deprived. And again, uh, as, uh, it's a kind of a proxy for chronic sleep curtailment. We found that children who were more likely or had a higher score uh, indicating that they had more exposure to being sleep uh, insufficient also had higher body mass index Z score, fat mass index, and waist circumference. So there's something there. And you know, I, I was a bit of a skeptic with this, but I have, you know, we study so many different risk factors. And this is one where you cannot make this effect go away. Um, so, um, and this is just another way of looking at this idea that it's, we found two things. One is that this early infancy sleep appears to be a critical period and has a lasting effect on uh, increased BMI. But that uh, if you look at the six month to seven year, the kind of cumulative uh, short sleep that it still is associated with, uh, with higher body mass index. So we found shorter sleep duration both in infancy um, uh, and chronic sleep curtailment is associated with higher body mass index Z-score and central adiposity at age seven. And sleep curtailment in infancy seemed to have the largest effects on BMI Z-score. Another indication um, that we should be starting earlier for some of these uh, preventive messages so the implications of this, and I, I presented this at the pediatric meetings and, and got really great questions afterwards, is you know, sleep is a modifiable risk factor. How we modify it is, I think, the next, the next directions to go in with our research. Um, and our findings suggest that there's this possible critical window early in childhood, which again reinforces my, my stance on early prevention. So, what are mechanisms that, that relate sleep with obesity? I think that the one that's gotten the most attention is kind of this interruption of appetite or, or, or interruption of the usual effect of appetite hormones, leptin and ghrelin, and that leading to increased hunger, 
which increases our caloric intake and leads to obesity. And there's some really great laboratory studies in adults, uh, mostly actually very few in children, that show alterations in ghrelin and leptin, our appetite hormones, and glucose intolerance as a result of sleep restriction. There's some really great lab studies where they bring uh, normal adults into labs, sleep restrict them, and find pretty quick differences in, and changes in their appetite hormones. There are also some really great studies in uh, shift workers where they also bring them into uh, labs and um, let them sleep, and they, uh, they actually are able to see the opposite effect on appetite hormones. So if you, in some early evidence that you can actually change some of these metabolic uh, functions if you improve sleep duration. Um, so the changes in those uh, uh, sleep hormones could make long-term adherence to a diet more difficult. You can just imagine um, how you, you're essentially going against your physiology <laughs> if you are trying to maintain your weight and trying to maintain a diet, but you have, uh, if, if you are sleep deprived and you have kind of the, the counter um, effect on some of these appetite hormones, it make it particularly difficult to diet. Increased opportunities to eat. And I, I, I see this, I think, uh, quite a bit in some of the, the uh, children that we see is that if we ask some of the children in, in my clinic what they are doing to replace that short sleep, uh, they're watching more TV. And I think that that's probably leading to increased mindless eating. And that whole sense of um, you know, too little sleep leading to more opportunities to eat could be through their exposure to television viewing. But also, I think, and this, you know, it, it's something that I'm very interested in, is how does um, too little sleep kind of blunt your ability to interpret the messages that you're seeing on television? So how does it, if you are sleep deprived, how does that affect kind of your cognitive functioning to understand um, what you're being exposed to through food marketing and other types of marketing. And it, it's another example of um, not always taking from the adult literature evidence of what could be uh, explaining the mechanisms in children. And I think that that's another one where this idea of what does short sleep duration do to your exposure through television of, of marketing is, is important and understudied. There's some work on altered thermoregulation, which reduces your energy expenditure. Uh, increased fatigue, if you are uh, if you're sleep deprived, makes you more sedentary, less uh, able to participate in physical activity. And there's some really great research that's starting to emerge on common genetic pathways, polymorphisms in um, in genes that affect both your uh, sleep patterns but also affect your metabolic patterns. There's one in particular called CLOCK, where a polymorphism in this CLOCK gene is associated with both metabolic syndrome and, uh, and uh, sleep patterns that could set you up for, uh, for um, shorter sleep duration. So, you know, it, it's it's interesting to see some of the the mechanisms, but more interesting to try to understand how can you how do you intervene then to improve sleep duration and and quality, and I think the the you know the million dollar question is if we increase sleep duration or improve sleep quality in children, do we uh, can we see an effect on obesity? And I, I the other. Uh, major disqualifier with the evidence in sleep is that there are no randomized control trials that have attempted to improve sleep duration um, to affect BMI. There's some uh, that are currently happening, and probably in about two years or so, when those randomized control trials are completed, um, we're going to have some really good evidence about whether this translates in the real world into effects on BMI. Um, almost all of those studies uh, going on right now are in adults. So I mentioned our mommy and me intervention. And what we're always asked is, you know, it, this was our first time doing an intervention to improve sleep quality in infants. And so what we were asked is, how did you, what did you do? What did you counsel these moms to do? So this was in infants. And we essentially developed a behavioral program to prevent sleep problems from starting in the first place. So we started at birth in the first three weeks of life, 
And the big goal in those first three weeks was to avoid all sleep associations. And what do I mean by that? We, um, the biggest thing that we taught the women to do and the, the parents to do in those first three weeks was to try not to have that infant fall asleep with anything other than you know nothing in the crib, nothing that they would associate with what they needed to fall asleep. So that meant trying not to rock, hold, or nurse the infant to sleep, nursing the infant but putting them down in their, cre- in their crib, drowsy but awake, um, accentuating the differences between day and night, uh, focal feeding between 10 p.m. and midnight until the infant uh, at three weeks or a month of age was um, shown by their pediatrician to be on a, on a healthy weight trajectory. If they were undernourished, then we asked them to talk to their pediatrician about whether those uh, nighttime feedings were going to be important. But by the time an infant is one month of age, they don't need so frequent, uh, so frequently to be fed at night. And what we tried to teach the women after a month of age was to start lengthening the time between feeds at night by slowly wake, uh, you know, changing that association between waking up and expecting to be fed. If an infant is growing normally and, um, and has a normal weight for length, they are going to start requiring less uh, feeding overnight. And the other thing that we did was to encourage the women to establish a calming bedtime routine early. And I, I didn't put the results here, but with these very simple preventative messages, we weren't ferberizing, we weren't, um, we weren't doing cry it out, we weren't teaching women to do these you know, very complicated sleep um, interventions. All we were doing was teaching prevention, teaching the mother to let the infant fall asleep on their own and self-regulate. We found really um, significant changes and improvements in sleep duration. In another intervention, and this is one that we just finished, actually, um, this is called our Healthy Habits, Happy Homes intervention. It's a randomized control trial to improve household routines for obesity prevention. And this is an RCT where we recruited from four pediatric primary care practices in Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston. We targeted uh, children two to six years of age and their mothers. And the duration of the intervention was six months. We enrolled um, 121 mother-child pairs. And in this intervention, what we really wanted to do was um, go into the homes and try to do with the parent uh, an assessment of their home and how conducive it was for some of the household routines that we wanted them to implement. So that involved motivational coaching by a health educator who did on-site visits to the homes of the mothers. Um, of the families and by telephone. We sent out uh, educational materials through the mail and behavior change incentives. Um, And we started doing weekly text messages. This was our first uh, intervention where we we were trying uh, texting uh, because of focus groups that from with mothers that told us that they want everything at their fingertips. They they're not going to websites anymore. They're going they're checking their smartphone. So this is our first entry into text messaging and we've now actually, we're doing it in a couple of interventions where we developed a library of messages consistent with some of the routines that we wanted to work on and then behavior change strategies and tips that can fit into a sentence. Um, I don't have examples of them, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to send them along. We were promoting regular, uh, regularly eating meals together as a family uh, sleep was one of our uh, our behaviors, our routines, sorry, limiting screen time. And then overall, uh, healthful diet and physical activity behaviors and parenting strategies such as limit setting, role modeling, allowing children to self-regulate. So, you know, what did we do for sleep here? So the, the main messages for sleep that we had in this intervention was create a calm bedtime routine. Every single child should have a bedtime routine and children should be going to bed earlier. And I don't have the baseline results. Sorry, this is our, one of our uh, goal sheets that the, uh, the health educators would use with, uh, for motivational interviewing, depending on what they were covering that day with the mom in the home. Um, so preliminary results, because I think we just ran this last week, shows that at six months, uh, compared to control interventions in, uh, or control participants, intervention participants had higher 
uh, prevalence of irregular bedtime. When we started, um, the, the number of parents that endorsed a regular bedtime, their child going to sleep every single day at the same time, including weekdays, was about 15% in both groups. And that increased to about 32% in the control group and 75% in the intervention group. They had earlier bedtimes. Um, when we started this intervention, the usual care and, or sorry, the control children and the intervention participants were going to sleep at about 9.30. Um, these are two to six year olds, mind you. And uh, at the completion of the intervention, the intervention children were going to sleep earlier or being put to bed earlier, 8.35 versus 9.45 for the um, uh, controlled children. They were sleeping more, 56 minutes more, or 53 minutes more than the uh, control children. And more intervention families had reduced or removed the television from the room where their child sleeps. And these were some very simple messages that we gave to the parents in their home about how to make their environments conducive to uh, families following these routines. So, you know, I, I sometimes get um, pushback from, from some of the providers that we work with about, well, you know, these are really difficult to change. These behaviors that, you know, you want us to try to counsel on getting those TVs out of the bedroom, just bring it up and try. And, you know, we had never done interventions around sleep, but we were pretty familiar with the evidence of what we could target. And we have really great staff who now are really... Um, invested in learning behavior change strategies and working on those tips with families. But, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a, a tip for um, those of you who want to do this in practice is that, you know, the, these aren't huge um, and complicated interventions. These are really simple um, behavioral messages that we do and we do reinforce with, with materials and counseling and motivational interviewing. But um, none of these things are, are uh, super complicated to do. So, you know, so far it looks like with some very, um, you know, simple interventions and simple uh, counseling, it looks like we can uh, make some changes in sleep duration. And now the follow-up of these children, now that we know that we could change their behaviors in another six months, is to see whether we change their body mass index. So stay tuned for that, too. So um, to summarize, I think uh, sleep is one of those things where we know it's associated with several adverse health outcomes in children and adults. I, I always gauge you know, the, these uh, behavioral targets that we work on in obesity as if there's little risk to promoting it, um, but a high yield in counseling on it, then, you know, so, so this, is a, this is a quote from, um, Adi and all, and I could find the source of this, but when the exposure is both common, which it seems like too little sleep is, and modifiable, which we now have evidence that we can modify sleep, and the outcome is costly, as obesity is in terms of morbidity, mortality, economics, even a small relative risk is of great public health relevance. And I think that that's why we're starting to see sleep entering into some of the uh, behavior change messages that, uh, that are being adapted or adopted uh, nationally. So um, there's still quite a number of unanswered questions. And I think it's, it's the reason why um, I call you know, some of the work with sleep and obesity, I say it's evidence informed. It's not yet evidence, completely evidence based. There are so many unanswered questions. In adults, there's a U-shape relationship between sleep and obesity, where too little sleep but too much sleep is associated with metabolic outcomes. And you can imagine that the characteristics of someone, an adult who sleeps too little, versus the characteristics of an adult who sleeps too much, there are differences in those uh, adults. And at least in adults, it shows that um, there is a, a U-shaped relationship. And, there's some question about what the optimal dose of sleep should be. Is there a threshold effect? Is, is it so clear as it was in infancy that 12 hours seemed to be this kind of risk threshold? What is the risk threshold um, after infancy? Um, if we increase sleep duration and quality, can we prevent weight gain? And I think that's the million dollar question. And I think while there are adult studies happening uh, that I know of, there aren't very many uh, pediatric interventions trying to do this. Um, Reverse causation and residual confounding is always an issue. So, you know, sleep and obesity are are, um, are uh, interrelated, but so is obstructive sleep apnea and obesity. 
And the same things that might be causing the insufficient sleep might also be causing the obesity. And then are the mechanisms relating sleep and obesity the same in childhood as they are in adulthood? There's, it's, it's incredibly understudied um, what, what relates sleep to obesity in, in children. So I'll end with a, with a really great blog from the New York Times that I, that I like. It's called Good Night and Tough Luck. And it's by this writer who says, you know, getting a good night's sleep is actually a lot more complicated than one would think. And this person must have children because this, this is exactly my life right here. So next up, a visitor from the kids' room. They start all sweet and cuddly, but their little bodies become more brazen by the minute. Those of you with children will recognize this. To make things worse, our kids almost always insist on sleeping on top of our blanket, creating a whole new set of problems. After weeks, weeks of sweet talking, serenading, and fervorizing, we think we have reclaimed our bed until a short trip or a quick flu undoes everything again. <laughs> so we, you know, it's much more challenging than we would think, but we, <laughs> we think we have at least some preliminary strategies to work on this. Thank you. BC, uh, so sleep is one determinant of many clinics. Yes. So the big picture, what's your expectations? Is this 5% of the determinant or is that a bigger determinant? And I know this might be a possible question. I mean, it's, it's hard to know, but you know, I, I do think there's quite a bit more evidence with other risk factors like food marketing and television viewing. So, you know, where I would where I would place this right now in my list of behavioral targets that I work on in my clinic, I'd probably, you know, it, it's not, um, if I had five things to work on, it'd probably be one of the, you know, the fourth or fifth, because I do think there's stronger evidence for sugar sweet beverages and screen time and physical activity. But I think that might change. And so the way I interpret the evidence right now is still with some caution because I, I don't have studies that show. I mean, I think we should be promoting sleep and good sleep quality no matter what. But um, I'm always careful with making sure that when I give uh, you know counseling to parents that I have a good sense that that's going to lead to weight gain. So putting that into perspective, eating more fruits and vegetables. You know, I do that with all of my all of my patients, but my, my um, counseling is a bit nuanced with my overweight and obese patients. It's not eat more, it's replace the calorically dense snacks with fruits and vegetables. So it might be that sleep is going to be like that, that there are some families where the message is going to need to be nuanced and some families where it might be more important to touch on this versus other things that are better for heart health. But um, and, and things that are better for obesity uh, management and prevention. So. My practical question, so I have a two-month-old, six-month-old, <laughs> two-year-old, five-year-old, whatever age, they use a CD to fall asleep. Oh, the oh. <laughs> right, so, so that's a sleep association that they probably will, will get used to or, or will need to fall asleep, but then if they wake up at night, they'll probably look forward to go back to sleep. So, was your question, is that a good idea? What do you tell the, what do you tell the children? <laughs> good luck. Um, you know, it's, I, I am, I, it's so much easier to do prevention, and I, I feel pretty lucky that I get to do more prevention as I also do management. It's really tough to change a behavior once it's already in place. Um, most likely, that parent will have experienced the fact that if that CD isn't on, they're not going to go to sleep. And actually, what I've, you know, the way I engage families in talking about television viewing and getting the TVs out of the bedrooms is to acknowledge and get them to acknowledge the fact that no one is sleeping well in that household. So, you know, if they're falling asleep with a CD, that probably means they have a television in the bedroom. It probably means that their sleep is affected. You know, yeah, for CD other reasons. CDs and sound only. Music only. Sound oh, sound, sound only. only. Oh, yeah, white noise. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay, so yeah, same same thing. It's it's just it's a difference between a screen versus a sound, and I would probably include that still under a sleep association. 
J just a quick question, your thoughts on this, Elsie. Do you, um, one of the things as a provider that I always get anxious about is when I have a child with sleep apnea and then they start heading toward tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, and we know how kids gain weight after a tonsillectomy. I guess mm -hmm. there's, I don't know, any thoughts or ways that you process? I'm looking for wisdom on how to, you know, I, I fear for our kids that are overweight with sleep apnea that are then heading for tonsillectomy, is this going to help or not? Right. I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a really good point. And, you know, the analogy for me is the children who are put on behavioral meds and we get referred those children eight months later when they've had drastic weight gain. And so these are some of the things that, you know, it's predictable. We know that these children with sleep apnea after their tonsillectomies are going to gain weight. You know, I, I don't have all of the answers. What we've done with our uh, clinical psychologists in our program with our behavioral meds uh, program is to say as soon as you put them on that medicine, you need to send them to us so that we can try to prevent the, what we know is a predictable pattern. We haven't done that as much with sleep medicine, but I think that it, it's the same, it's, it's you know, analogous. We know it's predictable that those children are going to gain weight after that uh, tonsillectomy. Disproportionately to then if they don't have a tonsillectomy. So, and I wouldn't, I don't know if it's disproportionately because, you know, the, I mean, you know heavy people get heavier. Is right, heavy people that, get or heavier or and... Is it related to the tonsillectomy? Right, and, and obstructive sleep apnea is associated with obesity. Right. So, you know, most likely they will get heavier, but the, the amount of weight gain I've seen after a tonsillectomy, and I don't know if you've seen this too, Chris, is just, it's pretty drastic. Pretty significant. Yeah, they were the, right. and the, what, the, what really brought it, to home, brought it home was there was a study that indicated it was relatively disproportionate, that it was a real bump up. Don't know. Don't know? Don't know. Did they It did. It did. But mm. again, it's, it's just this association that it's yeah. hard to know what to deal with. And I think the idea uh, of being pre uh, jumping on it early makes, a, makes sense. But I, I completely agree. And it's the same thing that we're, we're trying to put in place with the, the start of Risperidol and all of the behavioral meds is that it's, it seems predictable that these children are gonna need a little bit of tailoring of our weight management to prevent what, what we know is gonna happen or, or what we've seen happen in a lot of these cases after a tonsillectomy or after the placement on these meds. Thank you. Um, hi, Charlie. Hey, Elsie. Uh, this is a little more of an academic question, but uh, again, I appreciated your acknowledging the, your initial skepticism in the field. Melissa Wake did publish a negative randomized trial from England about an right. intervention which did affect sleep but didn't affect BMI. And I'm just wondering what the sense in the field is about, uh, you know, was it simply one small study, random variation, et cetera, or were yeah. methodological issues that, you know, make you discount the findings? From right, no, so, so that was, um, it was an intervention. And, and it, it, it's the reason why there's still some skepticism. You know, the, the it, it, and, and it showed, um, that they were able to change uh, sleep, but didn't uh, change the weight for length in these children, I think BMI. So the trouble I think that's been raised with that study is methodologic. So, um, you know, the, the way sleep was measured, which is really the way we all measure it is through parent sleep duration or a report of sleep duration. And I think still there's some need for um, objective measures of, of sleep. There was some indication in that study that the families in the intervention group um, their reports even at baseline of their child's sleep duration was different from the control group. So, you know, I, I, and I think there's still reason for skepticism, but I do think that um, what would be really helpful for the field are objective measures of sleep duration with actigraphs, with, you know, objective measures of anthropometrics. So yes, I, I, I take all of this. I, I, I'm not a fanatic about anything, <laughs> I think, until, until we have, um, pretty good consistent evidence, it's probably good to, to be a little bit cautious about having this take over some of the things where there's so much better evidence for. Thanks for your question, Charlie. A quick question as to whether in, in the Mommy Me study you're considering mom's sleep at all, yes. given the maternal BMI influence on kids. Yes, so I, I didn't show you some of the results that we've done for women's, uh, The so we did measure mother's sleep duration in the postpartum period. And it is 
I mean, we talk about shift workers and their, their interruptions in sleep and metabolic function. In these women in the postpartum period, they have tremendous metabolic changes because of their insufficient sleep. So we did this study. We published it about a year or two ago where we found that um, sleep duration in the postpartum period at six months and a year, um, that women in those uh, who had who were reporting less than five hours of sleep had increased uh, CRP, all of the, you know, increase in, in all of the inflammatory markers, higher LDL, higher total cholesterol. I mean, it, it, it was essentially the metabolic pattern of, you know, a severely obese adult. How do you know cause and effect on that, though? How did you know that right. you weren't picking a group of people that had an adrenergic response yep. to their pregnancy and those were the patients? Excellent, excellent question. So we had... Um, all of those inflammatory markers at baseline. So we had them in pregnancy at six months and one year and three years. And what we did was we looked at uh, change in those inflammatory markers as the outcome, and we looked at changes in their sleep patterns in that first year of life with the, uh, with the anthropometric and inflammatory outcomes. So, you know, it's 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 you know it, it's a it's a longitudinal study. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but changes in sleep duration from six months to one year was associated with uh, contemporaneous changes in their inflammatory markers. But couldn't you just say this? I mean, very, and I'm not was it cross sectional? No, no, no. Just think that you're picking a group of patients. Some patients are going to have hormonal issues after pregnancy. Those hormonal issues are going to then induce sleep disruption, as opposed to sleep right. disruption inducing those hormonal abnormalities. Right. So, so yes, and that that's completely plausible. But what was what seemed to make clear the the direction of the relationship was that those uh, changes in sleep duration in that first year of life seem to have persistent change, you know, effects on changes in these inflammatory markers. So, so you're right. It could be, you know, the, the, the direction of the, of the relationship might be a bit confusing, especially in that first year when so much else is happening. But the fact that there were um, these kind of long-lasting changes a year or two later seemed to really indicate that it was that, uh, those changes in sleep during that period. Um, so we did, we haven't actually, in some of, in that mommy and me intervention, we tried to also work on the women's sleep. Didn't really get very far. I'm still trying to figure out. I think that would be a great study to do. I think every woman would love to, to see that. Um, but that'll be the next study. Thanks. Thank you.